I'm going to get started just with very brief introductions, but I want to begin even before that by saying thank you to you all for coming today. I know that it is a particularly busy time of the semester with a number of competing events, and we are delighted to see you here. So um, I just want to say that today we are actually in collaboration with the Pardee Center at, the, at Boston University, thanks to Joe Harris. And, uh, and we have here on the screen a, a kind of larger set of events uh, around global <coughs> health that are open to the public and are also streamed via Zoom. And so for any of you who have interest in kind of pursuing some of the thoughts or references, but also just kind of, you know, attending more talks around the politics of global health, this would be, I think, an excellent resource. So today we are really spoiled by having five incredible speakers who represent different disciplines, sociology, political science, uh, also methods, uh, ethnographic methods, comparative historical analysis, statistical, large-end methods, and looking at a range of different diseases and dimensions of public health in many different parts of the world. And you'll get a sense of the range of the work and also the quality of it as our speakers get started today. And so I'm going to keep introductions extremely short and also to let you know that you know, we could spend a month with these speakers, a week, at least a whole day, asking them each to kind of give us long presentations. So I hope you'll think of this as really a flavor, um, kind of giving you a tasting of some new perspectives, new exciting perspectives on global health, but also an <coughs> entryway into each of these scholars' research, which is literally like we're just giving you the absolute lightest taste of it. So each speaker will go for between 10 to 15 minutes, um, and we'll have hopefully still plenty of time for discussion afterwards. And we will go in, our, our poster is actually a constellation, so I was trying to come up with a list, but um, we'll start with Siri Su. Um, did I pronounce your name right? Sue. Sue, perfect, close. Um, yeah, well, someone who has my name regularly mispronounced. I understand. Um, I'm I get it. Um, sensitive to that. So Siri is a professor of sociology at Brandeis University and has worked on questions of reproductive health. Has a book coming out, out called Dying to Count. Oh, it was um, published. Has it been published? Yep. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. That's excellent. And, and will be speaking to us first. Second, we have uh, Professor Kevin Crook who is at this Harvard School of Public Health and again has a wealth of exciting material um, and has got an exciting new book on primary health care across the world but focusing in particular on Africa. Third, we have Professor Rosemary Taylor who comes to us from Tufts and has worked on everything classic work on new institutionalism but also critically on disease identities uh, across the world but also especially in Europe. Number four, we have uh, Professor Joe Harris who has worked on things like universal health coverage, the role of bureaucrats and other kinds of health personnel, particularly in East Asia and Thailand. And we'll conclude with Gauri Vijaykumar, who works on the same part of the world as I do uh, in India, and in particular on questions of sexual health and, and HIV. And so please join me in just giving a round of applause uh, to this incredible panel, and we look forward to each of your presentations. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for um, coming during your lunch times. Thank you to the Watson Center and to the Party Center um, at BU for, uh, for, for hosting. Um, my current project explores how misoprostol is transforming the technological, political, clinical, and professional landscape of reproduction in Burkina Faso and Senegal. Now, as many of you probably know, misoprostol is a uterotonic medication that softens the cervix and causes the uterus to contract. This medication was first released on the global market in the mid-1980s under the brand name Cytotec by Searle, which is now uh, uh, under Pfizer. 
for the treatment of gastric ulcers. Since the late 1990s, misoprostol's effectiveness for off-label indications such as first trimester abortion, post-abortion care, and the prevention and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage has been documented in many studies around the world. And since Pfizer's patent on misoprostol ended in 2000, it has been manufactured by pharmaceutical companies around the world and is available um, under a variety of uh, brand names around the world. So I've shared some photos um, of misoprostol in, Sen in Senegal. The image in the middle was taken at a a private pharmacy where two brands of misoprostol, MisoClear and Misodia, both uh, manufactured in pharmaceutical companies in India, are in stock. And the image on the right was taken in the maternity ward uh, um, of a public hospital. And before I go any further, I want to acknowledge my fantastic partners on this project, Dr. Tijan Ndoy, who's a sociologist from l'Université Sheikh Antadjab in Senegal, and Dr. Nathalie Sawadogo, who is a demographer from l'Université Joseph Kizerbo in Burkina Faso. So in December 2022, the World Health Organization announced that in the past decade, Africa's progress against maternal mortality had flatlined. Um, and that it will need to reduce maternal deaths by a massive 86% to reach the sustainable development goal, the, su the sustainable development goals by 2030. Hemorrhage is a leading cause of maternal death in Africa, whether related to labor or unsafe abortion. And while skilled attendance during delivery has increased throughout Africa, quality of care remains a significant problem. So misoprostol has been lauded by global reproductive health uh, experts as a pharmaceutical solution to the persistent problem of maternal mortality in developing countries. It is relatively inexpensive in small quantities. It's amenable to self-use or administration by non-physicians, and it's heat stable. It does not require a, uh, a cold chain. Misoprostol holds particular promise for improving women's access to reproductive health care in sub-Saharan Africa, where nearly 62% of global abortion deaths occur, where hemorrhage accounts for at least 25% of maternal death, and where there are only 2.2 health workers per thousand population. And so the World Health Organization, starting in the mid-2000s, um, uh, starting uh, began to incorporate misoprostol onto its list of essential medications for various obstetric, indication, uh, obstetric indications, including induced abortion, post-abortion care, and preventing and treating postpartum hemorrhage. So our research takes up the story of misoprostol in Francophone Africa, where NGOs have been conducting clinical research on misoprostol for post-abortion care and postpartum, uh, postpartum hemorrhage since the mid-2000s. Now, some of this research on misoprostol for approved obstetric indications has been funded by donors like US USAID and the Gates Foundation uh, that typically do not support abortion-related um, activities. Throughout the region, ministries of health have integrated misoprostol for approved um, obstetric indications into national lists of essential medications and onto national pharmaceutical um, supply systems with multiple brands registered across the region. A handful of ethnographic studies suggest that misoprostol use for abortion is common in urban areas, and women obtain misoprostol with or without a prescription from formal and informal health workers, as well as from friends, relatives, and partners. However, these studies also show that access to misoprostol requires significant social capital, and that low-income women are most likely to be exploited financially and sometimes sexually by vendors and brokers of abortion services. There have also been important shifts in the political landscape of abortion, so in 2020, 21, um, the uh, uh, Organisation pour le Dialogue pour l'Avortement Sécurisé, um, Organization for Safe Abortion Dialogue, um, was launched. It's really the first of its kind in the region to openly engage with safe um, abortion. And so this um, is a regional network that supports advocacy, funding, um, or fundraising, research, health system strengthening, as well as uh, work around uh, commodity uh, uh, commodity securities. Um, also in 2021, the country of Benin decriminalized abortion under uh, most, most circumstances. So in popular and global public health literature, 
and in conversation with some of our interlocutors um, who are safe abortion advocates um, or who fund um, abortion-related activities or programs, misoprostol is often described as a pharmaceutical solution or a silver bullet, a magic bullet to the problem of maternal mortality uh, related to obstetric hemorrhage, but mostly from unsafe abortion. It's framed as a revolutionary, transformative, transgressive, and even feminist intervention. Right? Medications like misoprostol transform and transgress the meanings um, and practices related to abortion because they remove abortion from medical legal systems and place them into women's hands. Right? This is precise, precisely where we got the, the name of our uh, project, into, into women's hands. The private sector is framed as a vital part of this process, right? a site where consumers can discreetly obtain medication to self-manage abortions. Most of what we know about misoprostol in Burkina Faso and Senegal comes from statistical studies of availability in private pharmacies, so you know, brick and mortar pharmacies, and public hospitals. And it should be noted that most of these studies are funded and co-conducted by NGOs and donors that are headquartered in the global north. Despite these developments, little is known about the circumstances under which misoprostol is purchased sold, distributed, and used by consumers and health workers in the private and public uh, sectors of the health system and by nonprofit um, organizations. And, and so our study aims to move beyond popular narratives of misoprostol's life-saving uh, potential and narrow statistical estimates of misoprostol's availability to illuminate multiple pathways through which misoprostol is available to some women health workers and health facilities, and not others. And not only for self-managed abortion, but for obstetric care um, more, uh, more generally. Now, while misoprostol often tends to be framed as a newish uh, reproductive health technology in the region, we insist on situating misoprostol in a much longer history and politics um, of reproduction in the region, including the role of the USAID um, with restrictions around um, abortion services and technologies, such as the Mexico City policy and the Helms um, 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 Amendment, um, you know, starting in the early 2000s until uh, around 2020, um, there has been a huge debate at the level of the World Health Organization um, in terms of whether uh, there is sufficient evidence that misoprostol is as effective as the current gold standard for managing uh, a postpartum hemorrhage, uh, which is oxytocin and which requires um, um, a, a, a cold chain. Uh, there, there is evidence from um, uh, Uganda that the introduction of misoprostol by NGOs um, you know, led to parallel health systems or, or, or parallel uh, forms of, and unequal forms of, of health care, right, between the uh, private and, and, and public sectors. Um, and finally, you know, uh, we also recognize um, misoprostol's capacity as an abortifacient within a much longer uh, history of population control, um, in the region of uh, Francophone Africa, which has you know, some of the world's highest rates of fertility, where since the 2000s, um, uh, fertility in this region has been conceptualized as a vector for climate change, uh, for transnational migration, and for Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalism. Um, in 2019, for example, a Finnish parliamentarian suggested mass abortions. Um, for women in Africa as a, 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 a solution uh, to, the climate, uh, uh, to the climate crisis. So with all this in mind, our study explores the distribution, procurement, circulation, availability, quantification, and use of misoprostol by consumers, pharmaceutical vendors, health workers, health authorities, donors, and NGOs in Burkina Faso and, um, and Senegal. And we use a comparative, multi-sided uh, approach to illuminate how the local context intersects with regional and global policies to shape the availability, use, supply, and distribution of uh, misoprostol for approved and unapproved obstetric indications in these countries. So through this approach, 
we aim to examine right, the complex geopolitical and health systems and professional processes involved in approving and registering the drug, determining who can administer it, and in making it available and affordable to women. In Senegal, for example, a study in 2021 found that the average cost of post-abortion care using misoprostol um, in public hospitals uh, was $62, right, which was not much lower in cost than surgical services, right, for, uh, for, 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 po for post-abortion care. So, you know, we're asking who decides what kinds of obstetric care should be available and where to Burkina Bay and Senegalese women? To what extent does the promotion of misoprostol in the private sector by international NGOs generate parallel and, un and unequal systems of obstetric care. How do these activities benefit or disadvantage uh, uh, various kinds of health workers, including physicians, nurses, uh, midwives, pharmacists, and traditional birth attendants, right, or other kinds of community health workers in urban, rural, private, and public sectors of uh, the um, health system. To what extent does the availability of misoprostol in formal and informal pharmaceutical markets contri contribute to improved reproductive health outcomes among women, and in particular, young, low-income, and rural women? So ultimately, you know, we hope uh, uh, with uh, this project and our data to inform policies and protocols related to clinical care, procurement, and prescription of misoprostol and use of misoprostol by health workers and women. And drawing on principles of reproductive justice, we aim to yield information that contributes right, to improved obstetric care and reduced maternal mortality through health systems strengthening. So just a few minutes um, about uh, our methodology. Um, our research takes place through a collaboration between three universities. And every aspect of this research is collaborative, including the development of our research uh, design, the development of our data collection instruments, um, and data, data, analysis, or data collection and analysis and the write-up um, of results. Our work is funded by the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, we, first, we received a first round of funding in 2022, and we just uh, received additional um, uh, funding for um, uh, uh, until 20. Uh, 2025. So we take an explicitly decolonial approach to knowledge production about reproduction that centers African universities in conducting research with the potential to influence policies that in turn affect Africans and African women and health workers in particular. My colleagues' universities receive the bulk of our funding because they are primarily involved in conducting and managing uh, uh, the field work that is conducted by our research assistants who are graduate uh, students at these institutions. And by training and mentoring and supervising young graduate students at national universities, we aim to contribute to a future generation of African researchers equipped with skills in um, um, ethnography at a time when statistical methods are often what's most valued in the uh, uh, field of public health. So our project aims not only to investigate structural inequalities in how misoprostol is used and distributed, but also to address structural inequalities in the production of knowledge about misoprostol and obstetric care more generally. So I've listed some of our uh, data collection methods, including in-depth interviews, observation. We just received um, IRB approval to do mystery, uh, mystery client. Uh, mystery client studies. I could speak for another hour about the many methodological and epistemological challenges um, we've uh, experienced. Um, you know, I will just end um, um, after I note that you know the most significant ex uh, 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 challenges we've been experienced have been. Um, from my institution at Brandeis University in terms of uh, structuring uh, equitable uh, contracts um, that determine you know, equitable uh, 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 flows and directions of resources. Um, somehow, inexplicably, Mexico City policy language showed up on our contracts um, um, earlier this year when we were renewing them. Our funder is not the USAID government, is not the US Agency for International Development, and the Mexico City policy is not active 
under the Biden administration, right? So this is just um, an example of some of the problems that can come up um, when doing this when doing this kind of research. So I will stop here um, and look forward to the Q and A. Thank you. Timer, so I make sure not to um, overshoot. And there we go. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and it's a, it's very much a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you to to, to Perna and Joe for uh, hosting and facilitating the the workshop. Uh, my name is Kevin Croak. I'm an assistant professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, and I work on uh, the topic that I'll talk about today, which is the politics of of primary health care. Uh, and I also uh, have a research interest in also the impact of, of primary health care healthcare programs. Um, so I, I work on the politics of, of health, but also, uh, as, as we'll talk about in, in the discussion, uh, some of the, the programs themselves and their, their impact on, on health and, and health outcomes. Uh, but one thing that I'm particularly interested in, in studying in, in this project, um, and I should say this is a this is a preliminary project. Uh, Perna very kindly said that this is a this is a book. Um, it's it's it aspires to be a book. So it's it's a it's a set of case studies uh, which have been completed, but which have not been fully synthesized. And so I'm really eager and, and interested to hear hear all of your feedback today. Uh, but the the topic is is primary health care. So uh, this has been a global aspiration at least since a, a famous conference in 1978 called the Alma Ata Conference. Um, and, and the idea here was that, you know, just as we overemphasize uh, complicated and expensive medical care in the U.S., uh, many low-income countries at this period in the late 1970s uh, were spending the vast majority of their health budgets uh, on curative care and on hospitals when the vast majority of, of health problems and especially uh, infectious disease and maternal and health challenges were things that could be addressed or prevented um, with, with primary health care, often delivered in, in rural areas um, by, uh, by doctors or more often by, by nurses or even community health workers. Um, WHO still uh, energetically promotes primary health care, and yet um, gaps across the world are, are, are vast. Uh, and the WHO you know, currently estimates that we we're failing to save 60 million lives that could be saved if uh, primary health care was adequately scaled up by, by 2030. Uh, and, and my interest is in the political factors. Um, so there are financial factors, there are technical factors, but um, in, the, in the previous period, the period after this Alma Ata conference, when many countries were inspired and attempted to uh, take their primary health care programs to scale, uh, many of them foundered uh, in the decade or more after, after the Alma Ata conference. And many of the retrospective analyses of these programs uh, pointed to political factors. Uh, these were often public health or, or global health researchers who were analyzing their own programs, and they came to political uh, diagnoses. But we, as political scientists, I think, have, have not studied this in as much detail. And, and you know, we, can, we can see some of the political challenges that, that come out of these public health case studies, um, distributional conflict between urban and rural areas, between classes, uh, even between doctors and, and lower medical cadres. Uh, but also ideology, you know, sh should, should public health uh, and primary health care dominate health budgets or uh, should there be a larger role for the private sector or, or for curative care, uh, as well as state capacity gaps and, and inadequate financing, which is always a challenge. Uh, so I want to consider the challenges today and how they can be overcome, the political challenges specifically, uh, and I'd like to do that through uh, three case studies uh, of very important countries uh, across, across Africa. Um, these are all places in which, with my other hat, with my public health hat, I've been working on interventions and, and, and program evaluations. And, and as I have worked on those research projects, I have really come up against many of the challenges that were highlighted in this earlier literature, you know, reflecting on the political challenges to PHC. But I have also seen uh, a number of countries and, and regions that have made, I think, dramatic progress and have overcome some of those political challenges. And so I thought these three case studies would be 
uh, a fascinating way of, of looking at this variation in success um, uh, or, or less success across PhD expansion. So the first case is Ethiopia, which many uh, people in health may be familiar uh, with you know, expanded primary health care in a very dramatic way over a 20-year period. Um, unfortunately, with the emergence of conflict in 2019, that, has, that progress has stalled. But it was a, you know, the current director general of the WHO or secretary general was the architect of this primary health care expansion. Um, the second is a series of policies in Nigeria. One is called the Saving One Million Lives Program. Uh, the other was the National Health Act, which was passed in 2014. Uh, and the third case is a, a major health system reform in Kenya, which uh, directly affected primary health care, which was their health decentralization, which followed from a constitutional reform um, in 2010. So each of these case studies, I think, takes the challenges which were identified in an earlier generation of, of, of study of, of primary health care programs and the political challenges, uh, and it tries to look at how these uh, countries, their, their ministries of health and, and other health reformers, have tried, to, have tried to surmount these political challenges. And so I'll, I'll highlight both areas in which they have surmounted those challenges and areas in which they um, have run up against persistent persistent difficulties. Uh, each of these cases is, is very rich and complex and, you know, as, as other speakers have said, could take up a whole, a whole day, a whole week, a whole seminar. But I'll give a, a brief outline and, and then just try to draw a few of the commonalities in the, in the time I have left. Uh, Ethiopia, under its, its former government, the EPRDF, it, it really saw health as a key element of a, of a broader developmental state project. Uh, and so it recruited uh, somewhere between 20 and 30,000 health extension workers uh, and deployed them to their lowest administrative level and made them fully uh, paid members of the civil service and, and made them a professional part of the health workforce. Beyond that, they instituted something called the Health Development Army, in which there was one volunteer health extension worker for every five households. So a, a massive mobilization of society. Uh, in this way, primary health care was really linked um, to a, a political mobilization project. Uh, this led to unusually strong implementation of primary health care. And, and it was something that was at the top of not only the Minister of Health speeches in many cases, but also the, the Prime Minister of the time. Um, and, and I'll show you in a moment how effectively this, uh, this translated into implementation. Um, but it also made the project vulnerable to political backlash, which occurred starting in 2019 and 2020. Uh, when, when civil conflict broke out. Uh, but first, just a, a picture. This, this is the distribution of public health facilities in Ethiopia in 2003. It's a country of you know, over 80 million people. This is not a huge amount of health facilities for, for that population. Uh, after this commitment to primary health care had been put into practice, uh, the picture looks very, I, I would say, dramatically different. Uh, so this is 10 years of investment in primary health care, uh, transformation of, of population coverage. Um, on the other hand, as my interviewees pointed out, you know, the fact that this was linked to a, a broader political project you know, added vulnerability to the project and, um, and made it vulnerable to the backlashes that uh, ultimately occurred. And so um, in a moment, I'll contrast this to a different way of pro approaching primary health care. In Nigeria, you had, uh, at the top of the Ministry of Health around the same period, equally, I would say, dedicated uh, reformers who had innovative ideas. Um, and they put in motion something called the Saving One Million Lives uh, project, which directly targeted uh, primary health care and maternal and child health, but also a broader systemic reform called the National Health Act, which tried to enshrine in law um, that 1% of, of the consolidated revenue fund, which is essentially where oil revenues accrue in Ethiopia, would have to be directed not just to health, but directly to primary health care. It would have to be transferred directly into primary health care facility budgets. Um, so I think like the Ethiopian case, you had innovative reformers at the top of the ministry who were really trying to solve uh, operational challenges and financial challenges of primary health care, uh, taking, taking resources and directing them to PHC. Uh, but one thing that has come through in, in my interviews around this project is that unlike Ethiopia, this was a, this was a ministry of health uh, or even a, a, a group within the ministry of health project. It was not linked to a broader political uh, project or, or mobilization. And, and so, so when the health reformers bumped up against a, a feature of the way political power is distributed in the country, uh, 
we, they were unable to overcome that. So a, a key feature of the Constitution um, in, in that country is that um, the Ministry of Health is only responsible for tertiary health care, so specialized hospital care. Secondary care is, is under the responsibility of state governors. Primary care is under the responsibility of local government authorities. And the Constitution gives primary health care budgets to governors, uh, and the Ministry of Health has little to no control over that. And there are limited to no mechanisms of accountability for these uh, health budgets at state level. Um, and so Ministry of Health people were very aware of this. They realized that the, the higher political levels would have to address this, this gap in accountability. Uh, but presidents in this period were unwilling or, or possibly unable to challenge this sort of fundamental constitutional bargain about uh, whether governors or, um, or central ministry had control over primary health care. And so we see similar, similar um, I would say, program design, but uh, a different sort of underlying distribution of political power, uh, which, which stymied, in this case, a, a primary health care project. Um, and as one, one interview, he said to me, you know, the governors are kings. You can use what he called soft power. You can explain your goals. You can invite them to workshops. You can try to incentivize them. But ultimately, they're in the health sector. They're they're kings, and and you, as the minister of health, have much less power than, um, than than everybody outside the country perhaps believes that you do. Uh, in my remaining moment or two, I will just say uh, the case of Kenya, which is a, a much less fully realized case study so far, um, is one in which I find I see both interesting parallels to the Nigerian case, um, but also uh, striking differences. Um, so the constitutional reform in 2010 decentralized uh, health services to the county level. So as in Nigeria, where, as we saw before, the governors are kings, in, in, uh, in Kenya, after 2010, governors control primary health care services. The Ministry of Health, again, has a, has a responsibility for higher level services and for policy and other functions. Um, so the Ministry of Health has much less power than it used to, uh, but in, at least in some uh, counties in Kenya, uh, there's interesting evidence of developmental coalitions emerging for health at the county level. Um, a, a research group that I've been part of in, in collaboration with Kemri Welcome Trust um, has been studying this in Kakamega County in, in Western Kenya for the last two years. And we've been observing a, a very dynamic and, um, and in many ways positive process of competitive politics at the county level that is focused on, in many ways, on health because it's one of only three of the services that governors control. And so, um, so this is in Kagamega. Um, the outgoing governor, he built a hospital in his home sub-county. This is a place called Butere. Uh, it was a place where there already was a hospital, and you might think this was maybe not the health-maximizing uh, step to take. On the other hand, you know, it's, it's also a hospital that's needed, um, and, and this is something that might look like what political scientists would call clientelism. You're directing resources to your home area. Um, you know, there's an element of, a, of, of responsiveness there, but also maybe inefficiency. Um, but on the other hand, we also see a, a very interesting dynamic where governors are also um, mobilizing, publicizing, and credit claiming around service delivery. And so that the current governor is very active on all communication platforms around trying to address shortage of drugs, in this case in a different hospital, a uh, place called Malava. Um, he's even gone to, this is just from a few days ago, he's even been mobilizing um, uh, a sort of coalition of officials to, to try to solve drug shortages, uh, in, you know, in, even accusing a, his own uh, hi officials of, of stealing drugs from hospitals and, you know, taking credit for solving these problems and improving services at the county level. Uh, and so what, one question we're very interested in, on, in is trying to understand why in some counties is there a kind of new politics of health emerging in which governors see themselves as accountable and, and try to take credit for, for positive, um, positive developments. Um, or in other places, these, these coalitions seem to be, um, seem to be more uh, nascent or, or having trouble getting off the ground. Um, and since I know I'm out of town, uh, uh, time, I'll just mention that this is in many ways based on, based on work which was not explicitly political, which was more about health programs, um, but in which I've learned uh, quite a bit about the, the politics of health with collaborators at EDRI in Ethiopia, um, uh, Nigerian co-authors, and then the Kemri Welcome Trust team, um, and also my Harvard colleagues in, in Kenya. So thank you very much.
Okay. Thank you. I want this. I could read it again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, thank you very much, Parna, for the introduction. And to you and Joe for the invitation to come to Brown and to the Watson Institute for hosting this event. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to this group uh, who are interested in issues of global health. Let me give you a little background. For the last decade, I've been looking at how societies and their governments deal with risk, in particular health risks, and especially those that are perceived, correctly or not, to come from beyond their borders. And the book I'm writing now is a compar comparative historical analysis of two viruses, HIV and hepatitis C, from the moment of their identification in 1984 and 1989 to the development of drugs to manage one, HIV AIDS in the mid-1990s, and actually cure the other, hepatitis C, in the mid-2000s. And in this work, I build on some of my previous work on what I call disease identities. And I explore first how each of these viruses were discovered, acquiring a clinical and scientific identity, and second, how policy responded to them as they acquired a political identity, and third, how compensation was or was not granted to those infected when HIV and HCV got into the blood supply based on a legal identity, and finally, how the drugs used to treat them were sold on the basis of a commercial identity. So that's kind of the background. But today, I want to talk about the issue of compensation. And my focus is on one case, because it's very difficult to generalize about the processes of compensation. As you probably know, during the 1980s, thousands of people re received uh, receiving blood products or blood transfusions were infected with either or both of these virus viruses. So the main empirical question I'm posing is, how did the British government decide whom to compensate for the harm they suffered from contamination of the blood supply and by how much to compensate them? And we can see this as a case study of a larger question, namely, how do governments compensate their citizens for irreparable, irreparable harm they may suffer amid disasters, particularly in cases where governments bear some responsibility for those injuries. How do they do compensation? And now it's hard to generalize about this, as I said, because at the moment compensation is a pressing issue in all sorts of dimensions. At the broadest level, people are asking for compensation or reparations for historical injuries and wrongs. And then there are a series of natural disasters, um, a lot of them brought on by climate change, which is wreaking damage across the world. And last week, we've witnessed significant flooding in New York. California appears to be on fire for ever longer periods during the year. And recently, we witnessed the catastrophic fire in Maui. And so, but these natural disasters, then, in terms of how their people are compensated for them, are different from those where people are public authorities are seen as bearing some responsibility for them. And then finally, there's quite a difference between whether governments feeling or being pressed into compensate. How is that done? Is it through a legal route? Um, is it done through a compensation fund? How else? OK. So um, turning back to the British case, there are several puzzling aspects to it. In Britain, compensation was granted seriatim to distinct groups through a process that advantaged some people infected with uh, NHS blood relative to others. And the groups given compensation changed over time in a process that extended over a period of 35 years and is not yet finished. I mean, as you'll probably know in the United States, people put that behind this whole issue behind them, you know, when they passed the a small, uh, well, they, they passed a compensation to hemophiliacs with HIV, but that was about 20 years ago. And Britain is currently having a third major public inquiry as we speak, which is shortly to report. So payments were initially made to people with hemophilia and HIV, to then to those with HIV but not hemophilia, 
and then to certain people with hepatitis C. And one of the puzzles is this. Why was financial support made available to narrowly circumscribed groups in this particular su succession? Now, this is a very long story, so I'm going to focus now only on the first group to receive any financial redress, namely hemophiliacs who were infected with HIV through their treatment with blood products. And I'm also going to use this case to make a theoretical argument with wider resonance about how governments operate, and in particular, about how the categories that are at the heart of governance are constructed and sometimes enshrined in policies. Oh, yes, I was saying also Fukushima. That's one of the major natural, well, natural followed by natural catastrophes followed by a catastrophe that some people thought the government should have handled better. So um, the theoretical argument, which I'm going to say a little bit about, is that the key point is that the process of assigning compensation for those infected by the blood supply was ultimately a process of categorization. It entailed drawing sharp distinctions between those who would receive payments and those who would not and then establishing the worth or the value of their suffering. And categorization is a fundamental feature of governance. In his account of the myriad ways in which states see, James Scott has noted that in order to make their worlds legible and there, thereby governable, governments end up codifying everything from land to people. But how are these categories constructed? And why do they take on a particular shape? These are the questions I'm going to uh, uh, cover very briefly today. And to do so, I'm going to take several theoretical steps. And, and more, I just have time to sort of lay out this theoretical approach, which I'm, which I'm interested in any feedback you may have. Because policymaking involves the construction of categories, it's always to some extent, of course, a cultural process. And it's been approached as such by a number of influential scholars. And first, I want to suggest that the prevailing views of the role of culture within this process are generally too crude. Explanations for how nations make policies and manage uncertainty, they often reflect an important school of thought that foregrounds political culture or a national regulatory style. I mean, a lot of the literature on Fukushima, for example, said, well, of course, compensation was done the way that the Japanese do it. They do it this way because they're Japanese, right? Meaning they have a certain cultural approach to this. And I argue that the concept of a national policy style or political culture is too blunt an instrument to capture how political decision-making proceeds. And in particular, these approaches tend to miss the dynamism involved in policymaking and in the concomitant process of categorization. To borrow Bill Sewell's insightful formulation, public policymaking is an intrinsically eventful process whose very eventfulness affects the character of the outcomes. So I argue that in order to understand who was compensated when and by how much in Britain, we need to recognize that the categories central to these outcomes emerged from my dynamic process of cultural negotiation that took place consecutively and sometimes simultaneously in several different institutional arenas. And I focus on the public political arena, the realm of the civil service, um, the voluntary sector of civil society, and the legal arena. Well, obviously, I do not have time to talk to you about all this. So uh, the second theoretical move I make is to argue that in each of these spheres, debate about the relevant categories was not predetermined by a national policy style or culture, but turned instead on distinctive features of these institutional arenas. That's to say, the relevant categories were inflected by what I'm going to call the institutional logic of each arena. So the questions here are, what are these institutional logics, and how do they work? Now, as some of you will know, the concept of institutional logics has a very long history. But much of this literature is curiously unclear about a key issue. What is the nature of the relationship between institutions and their logics, 
And in particular, why do certain kinds of institutions give rise to certain kinds of logics? And I'm not going to go into detail about this literature, but on the one side, there are some minimalist formulations in which these logics are said to be institutional, mainly because they can be found in social fields where specific kinds of institutions operate. And on the other side are maximalist formulations in which the cultural systems constitutive of these logics are giving such a superordinate status that they become responsible for creating the institutions themselves. In my view, the first approach doesn't say enough about why these logics are institutional, and the second assigns so much force to cultural logics that they become synonymous with irrelevant institutions, making it impossible to ask, why do certain kinds of institutional arenas give rise to certain kinds of cultural logics? So I'm using this British case to develop some more precise formulations about how institutional logics are generated and come to bear on the outcomes that emerge from each institutional arena. Now, I do not have time to um, lay out more about my theoretical perspective, so I'm going to just, I'm just going to skip over it really quickly um, and turn to uh, the British case again and um, just talk about one institutional arena in order to illustrate what I'm trying to talk about, about institutions and the relationship with their logics. So because contaminated blood and blood products were provided to hemophiliacs and others by the National Health Service in Britain, it was to the government that the injured and their families turned for compensation. Of course, to those who suffered from infection, compensation meant a lot more than financial redress. For the fa past 35 years, they've asked not only for financial support, but also for justice, which meant holding the government and others to account. They wanted an apology, and they wanted the punishment of the guilty. And this has not happened. What the injured received instead was money. And the process whereby they received it was protracted and in some ways peculiar. And I can't go into the, all the features of this process. Instead, I'm going to turn to the first institutional arena where people tried to make the case for compensation. And that is the parliamentary and public arena, where what was at issue was the basic decision to provide some kind of compensation. And three features of the outcomes that emerge from this arena are notable. First, this arena was initially the site of protracted resistance by the government for all claims for compensation. However, second, it became the arena in which pressure for compensation was felt most intensely and eventually succeeded. And third, the shape of this arena had much to do with the fact that the first, and for a very long time, the only group to be compensated was hemophiliacs. And hemophiliacs who had not both viruses, but only one, HIV. The, the conservative government under Margaret Thatcher first faced claims for compensation when contamination uh, of the blood it's supply- It's clear and 72 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, I was trying to time myself that that misfired. Um, the Conservative government under Margaret Thatcher first place faced claims uh, when contamination of the blood supply was revealed in the mid-1980s. And the initial reaction of the government was negative. In 1985, Kenneth Clark, then Minister for State, rejected these claims, declaring that there has never been a general state scheme to compensate those who suffer the unavoidable um, adverse effects which can unhappily result from many medical procedures. And he could hold the line in this fashion because he knew that the chances of people winning compensation through the legal system in Britain was very slim. I mean, in some countries, that's what happens. But in Britain, um, affected families uh, had to prove negligence, which is a branch of tort law. And negligence requires a very high standard of proof. Claimants had to show that the risk that led to injury was foreseeable and unreasonable, a difficult task in its own right, and especially in an era of modern manufacturing processes about which most claimants have no knowledge or access to information. So as late as, as 1987, then Secretary of State for Health and Social Services, John Moore, argued against providing compensation to hemophiliacs 
on several grounds, but most important on the grounds that it would set a precedent. Um, in many ways, we'll see, or we will not see in this talk, actually, that the arguments came directly from the Treasury, from the civil service. But then the institutional logic of the public political realm began to affect both the kinds of categories that became central to discussion of the issue and the eventual outcomes. As everyone here probably knows, the institutional setting for British democracy means that one of the principal objectives of any government is to retain the support of a wider public so as to win elections. And here, as in most democracies, the institutional of that logic of that arena is such that the most powerful political appeals within it often turn on the issues of fairness. So the issue of compensation was soon debated in the British po political arena in terms of categories that emphasize deservingness and issues of innocence and suffering, moral categories that did not have much influence in other arenas but engaged powerful scheme, cultural schemas at the heart of British um, politics. So we find that in parliamentary debates about compensation, British MPs invariably adopted a discourse of innocence, special circumstances, finitude, and stigma. Um, a, 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 a story that appeared in The Guardian uh, in describing the social ostracism on the playground is typical of the relevant discourse, as you can see in this quote. And the message in this and similar articles is unmistakable. The playground is a, sense of, is a site of innocence, what hemophiliacs are experiencing is unfair. And we can see the institutional logic at work here, an issue that was debated inside official circumstances, largely in the pragmatic terms of cost-benefit analysis, acquired a different character in this public arena. What policymakers initially wanted to see as administrative categories were translated into moral categories, turning on guilt and innocence, and above all, moral deservingness. It's a long story, but faced with these kinds of appeals which carry particular power and resonance in the political arena, the government finally gave in, but only for the case of haemophiliacs. In November 1987, the Minister of State for Health wrote to his colleagues, and less than two weeks later, the government announced that it would make a payment of 10 million but pounds, but only to haemophiliacs infected with the AIDS virus. But uh, as he struggled to describe why only this group should get it, it was not lost on the civil service that some of the criteria that were cited for the award opened the government to claims from other groups. And it was concerns such as these that dominated the rather different discussion that took place within these other institutional arenas that unfortunately I do not have time to lay out for you. But... I'm just going to say, yes. And this is, as I said, an ongoing story. Um, this is, the, 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 those of you who are interested can keep their eye on a report that is supposed to be issued this month. And we'll see what the eventual outcome is. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, so first, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so first, uh, thanks to Prerna uh, and Hayden, the Watson Institute for hosting us and the Party Center for their sustained uh, support. Uh, it's great pleasure to be here with you all and share this uh, work with two former graduate students uh, that's a, currently a work in progress. Um, so this talk centers on what we call health technology assessment. We can think of that uh, in most basic terms as a kind of cost-benefit 
uh, methodology that's grounded in economic analysis. Safety and efficacy are two important concerns of this uh, methodological approach. Uh, it's brought to bear in use on determining uh, the sort of cost effectiveness of things like medical devices, pharmaceutical, uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, therapeutics, um, and it can be organized in a variety of ways. Um, you know, people, individual people can use HTA to do analysis on uh, the, the sort of cost effectiveness of different drugs, for example. Uh, it can be institutionalized in state agencies or nonprofit organizations, uh, or uh, professors can be uh, taken up by the state to do consulting projects on uh, different uh, different products that the state might be interested in uh, understanding more about. Uh, it can be required as part of state statutory processes uh, aimed at sort of understanding whether a drug should be included in a benefit package for a, a state health insurance program, or just simply an advisory opinion. But it's an important uh, tool uh, for uh, cost-effective uh, priority setting, uh, particularly in resource-constrained environments. We live in a world where universal health coverage has become very important. And so increasingly, in uh, resource-constrained environments, this is thought of as an important tool to help countries get there. And so given that HTA is not a new field, and the resource scarcity and need for priority setting and efficient resource allocation in the health sector uh, is uh, so important. Why is HTA institutionalization uh, a relatively recent phenomenon in uh, the industrializing uh, world? Why has a diffusion followed a more uniform pattern across regions? What accounts for uh, what I see is fragmented regionalism with greater levels of HTA agency development in Latin America and Asia and relatively lower levels in Africa. This is work that's based on archival uh, research at the WHO and also approximately 25 interviews with global HTA experts. This is a relatively small field, right? So 25 interviews may not sound like much, but uh, in fact, in that small rarefied space, it's, uh, it covers quite a lot of the field. We can think back about Ken Arrow's uh, paper, Uncertainty and Welfare Economics of Medical Care, in 1963 as sort of kicking off a lot of what many consider the field of health economics. It was not long after that uh, that the field of HTA was born. Uh, the U.S., of all places, was the first uh, country in the world to have an Office of Technology Assessment in 1974. That is ironic because we don't uh, allocate resources particularly efficiently in this country. As far as healthcare goes, we spend about 20% uh, of, our, our, of our economy on health spending. Um, but the, uh, the implementation of the U.S. OTA office, which was subsequently closed uh, in the 90s, uh, spread to other countries, uh, notably uh, Canada, Sweden, Spain. They all became early adopters of HTA, started their own agencies, and began also helping to uh, uh, this methodology to spread internationally. There were different uh, journals and professional associations that began to form. You see some there. The first international conference on HTA was in Stockholm in 79, and Sweden established the first uh, national HTA agency in Europe in 1987. Um, there's some more of the professional associations related to that in the early 90s. And so there's a great paper by Olga Lablova uh, that shows different waves of HTA adoption in Europe. Uh, we see one wave over about 13 years uh, that is uh, happening between 1987 and uh, 1999. Uh, there, uh, about five years later, uh, they have the, uh, another set of wave there and then some uh, non-adopters. Um, it wasn't until 2006, though, that the original HTA body formed called EUNet HTA. Now, that's quite interesting and sets the stage for us to look at other uh, regions of the world and patterns there. And even though this doesn't show up very well, I'll give you sort of some broad brush uh, strokes about other regions of the world. You do have different countries in Asia, like Malaysia, Taiwan, South Korea, Thailand, that have relatively long histories of HTA use and, in some cases, institutionalization of agencies. Some regional bodies that have helped to uh, further catalyze interest in HTA. Uh, and also a recent flurry of interest in that area in Latin America. A similar kind of story, some regional leaders like Chile, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, a, a new network of agencies starting around 2011, again after the European uh, one in uh, 2006, and uh, other regional developments. In Africa, um, some important 
uh, work being done uh, in South Africa that's aimed at helping to catalyze uh, greater interest in institutionalization of these methodologies there in the region, but relatively low levels of institutionalization. And if we look at other social innovations, it, to put this in focus, we can think about the field of conditional cash transfers. Also economic focused, right? Also about helping improve people's lives uh, broadly. But what's interesting there uh, in work by people like Maurice da Silva e Silva, uh, we see relatively rapid spread of CCTs around the world, driven by the World Bank uh, in large part. James Ferguson calls this a new emerging form of welfare provision around the world. And what's interesting, I think, in drawing that contrast is we see the relative absence of uh, the World Bank and the WHO as players in the field of HTA in a relatively critical period, right? After the OTA is founded in 1974 up through the 90s. Why is this interesting? Well, this is interesting because one, uh, the World Bank is relatively influential and growing so in the 1980s in, uh, in the field of health. Um, it is the largest uh, health funder, it's the largest funder in the field of global health today, dominated uh, by economists. Um, and in the 1993 World Development Report, Qualies and Dailies was really the centerpiece, right? Um, and at the WHO, um, what's interesting is uh, the, the interest in uh, HTA grew out of a WHO regional office, the one in Europe in Copenhagen um, that had a program on appropriate healthcare technology. Um, and it steadily fell under the influence of the World Bank's more technocratic approach, right? Um, uh, we see uh, leading scholars mention how the architects of the 93 WDR uh, moved from the World Bank to uh, Geneva over time. And uh, they, they began to build in the 2000s uh, more sort of economic focused projects. But it's really interesting because um, the, the development within the WHO uh, was pretty uh, slow. And uh, at the beginning, again, starting in a regional area, um, it was not until the 80s that the WHO took a more general focus on health technology. Uh, there was a uh, WHO advisory committee on medical research that embarked on a study about modern scientific concepts and methods uh, to human health. Um, and at the same time, the issue of technology transfer became to really uh, get a lot of traction and more interest. So that loomed much larger than uh, this uh, other issue of technology assessment in a uh, budding division of non-communicable diseases and health technology at the WHO. A move from this regional office to headquarters began to make HTA uh, loom a little bit larger, but again, long after the founding of the OTA in 1974 at, uh, in the US. And uh, here's one quote from the interviews that we did. Uh, they, as in the WHO, were not at all involved. It was very difficult to work with the WHO. It took decades before they understood what HTA is. They were stuck in this concept of medical devices, basic laboratories and equipment. And so uh, it's kind of remarkable, right? Because we would expect the WHO and the World Bank to both be promoting this, right, uh, heavily, uh, and yet we didn't see it. Another key informant remarked, uh, we had talked to people at WHO many times in relation to how are you going to do this? Every country should have at least one person devoted to HTA. It takes a frustratingly long time. A similar story at the World Bank, uh, HTA capacity building was not a major focus of World Bank efforts, even though um, people involved recognize the strategic value of having the World Bank involved as putting an element of pressure and a route to, of access to key local decision makers. But it was not until the 2000s, right? 25 years after uh, the OTA founding that the World Bank began to uh, fund efforts and those uh, centering in Europe. Um, so implications of this study, and I'll just conclude with this slide. Promotion and spread of an important innovation uh, this is about uh, promotion and spread of an important innovation, uh, and this relied principally on interested individuals, right? So uh, the founder of, uh, of uh, OTA in the U.S. did a lot of sort of missionary, missionary uh, work uh, in other parts of the world. Also, these emerging professional associations. But there was a surprising absence of the WHO and the World Bank during this critical period, and this led to really uneven 
incomplete institutionalization across regions. Whereas CCTs spread pretty evenly and quick, this did not, right? And what's interesting, I think, is to think about this in terms of politics, inequality, and state capacity. Relative to the private sector, pharma, insurers, hospitals, right, in the private sector, state capacity comparatively withered. That's a problem, right, if we care about building more robust UHC programs. And so this was uh, a real uh, concerning thing that I think we can think about and locate in broader discussions about decolonizing global health. All right, thank you. keep it short <laughs> so that we can get to our discussion. Um, so I will start with the um, they've ruined everything and gone part of the talk and then I'll come back to the, the, the reluctant global health sociologist part at the end. So these two quotations come from two people very differently positioned in the Indian AIDS response. Um, the first is one of the most well-known AIDS activists in India. She was involved in many of the prominent legal cases around um, sexuality and HIV. Uh, and the second is a sex worker activist who spent more than a decade doing peer education at bus stands uh, in the city of Bangalore, where I did my ethnographic fieldwork, and now works at a flower shop on the Bangalore Mysore highway. Um, so you can see in both of these, uh, they come together in a critique um, of, uh, uh, of the HIV AIDS and the more generally global health apparatus. Um, so the two are taking aim at slightly different types of actors. Um, the first points out the origins of the Indian AIDS response uh, in global health philanthro capitalism. Um, here's Bill Gates at one of the community-based organizations where I did field work for this project. Um, this was a $338 million project in India um, that opened in 2003 and ended uh, in 2012 and kind of continued closing down until 2014. Um, the second quotation here um, has a little bit of a more ambiguous um, target of critique. Uh, in the context of the broader conversation, um, the sex worker activist was talking about the global health AIDS apparatus, but more specifically some of the NGOs and activist groups that had sort of changed her life through the AIDS response. Um, but both indicate a kind of resentment toward the temporal frame of AIDS uh, activism and the definition of the AIDS crisis. Um, they're both living in the aftermath of the AIDS crisis, the sort of purported end of AIDS. 40.4 um, million people have died of AIDS-related illnesses since the start of the pandemic. 76% um, of people globally are now estimated to be accessing treatment. Uh, and new HIV infections have decreased by nearly 60% since 1995. Um, but both of these activists' comments and their lives were shaped by a disease response that had effects far beyond those types of metrics that I just mentioned. The AIDS response in India has shown this kind of globally financed spotlight on groups who had previously lived in the shadows of the law, sex workers, sexual minorities, transgender people, and drug users. Uh, and both of them in different ways became involved in activist groups that were catalyzed by the AIDS response. Um, their relationships to the state, to each other, and to themselves were transformed in this process. And then at the end of AIDS, they felt left behind. Um, they point out that even though the donors have declared success and gone home, they're still here. Um, and this was affected in material consequences. So in the aftermath of AIDS, the funding for their organizations was reduced. Um, they had offices closed down. Uh, and and my, my book, At Risk, is interested in you know, what happened after that or what remained after that. So what I want to present in this talk is kind of work that stretches across um, AIDS, the, the time and sort of what I call between pandemics, um, COVID-19. Uh, and so I'm kind of talking about my book as well as kind of 
some research after and sort of moving into a new project that I'm starting on kind of migrant labor, gender, and um, COVID-19. Um, so I draw attention to the temporality of crisis in all of these projects. Um, in thinking about global health this way, I've been learning from some new scholarship, so critical feminist scholarship on crisis. Um, like um, global health problems, uh, many other types of crisis too um, vary in terms of how acute they are, how chronic they are, how visible they are, how invisible they are. Um, disasters throw ongoing crises into relief, um, but for many marginalized people, the crisis has always been there. Um, so um, one example is Luft's work on post-Katrina Louisiana. Um, she develops the, the concept of racialized disaster patriarchy, which is kind of a twist on Naomi Klein's disaster capitalism. Uh, her interlocutors in Louisiana talk about crisis upon crisis upon crisis. Uh, and her larger point um, is that what is part of what is disastrous is patriarchy and not just the moment of um, Hurricane Katrina. Um, many feminist scholars writing in India about COVID-19 have articulated similar types of critiques. Um, so here are just a kind of couple of um, uh, mentions of scholars who have done some of this work kind of looking at COVID-19 and its effect on precarious uh, women workers, um, uh, particularly domestic workers. Um, so here in one of them, uh, we may survive the coronavirus, but we'll certainly die of hunger. And this is actually a, a comment that's repeated in many of the kind of um, civil society reports of migrant workers in the context of COVID as well as transgender um, people. Um, so these um, observations reflect these kind of ongoing patterns of suffering within which disasters play out. Um, at the same time, crises like AIDS and COVID attract heightened attention, right? So some scholars have called this AIDS exceptionalism, right? The, um, the exceptional status afforded to certain crises um, to, the, to the detriment of attention to others. Um, so in the introduction to a volume on AIDS that was written um, and published um, just as the COVID-19 pandemic began to unfold, so the book came out in 2020, um, the authors write, by definition, crisis is exception. It is an occasion for judgment, an opportunity to render power, yet a crisis is not meant to last. So built into the logic of um, crises, and I want to suggest um, uh, uh, global health uh, responses too, is this contradictory outcome that the response, the response to disaster overshadows other ongoing crises, um, but then is sort of abruptly forgotten after the crisis is decided to be over. So uh, my first book kind of responded to this uh, literature on the temporality of crisis um, by situating it within the battleground of civil society. So one of the things I really tried to convey is that the temporality of crisis wasn't just determined by global health institutions, but it was also sort of worked out through the struggles of social movement groups who demanded to expand the definition of what an AIDS response might look like, um, and eventually built some organizational infrastructure structures that kind of situated HIV within the larger forms of structural violence that enabled HIV to take root in the first place. Um, so I want to, um, and this, by the way, is an image of um, one of the activist groups I studied um, and write about in the book, um, holding a protest of some of the AIDS um, organizations and funders. Um, so this is the kind of fieldwork that's sort of the basis of my book. Um, so um, in my last kind of few minutes, I want to talk about some kind of uh, uh, fieldwork or uh, interviews I've done in the in the period after my book came out. Um, and this is a, a series of interviews that I did with people, mostly who I had been um, part of uh, their organizations and their kind of work while doing ethnographic fieldwork in India in 2012 and 2013, uh, and wasn't able to be in person with um, during the pandemic lockdowns. Um, and so I did interviews um, over Zoom, and this is sort of similar to the caveat that Joe um, gave about his interviews, that 18 interviews feels like a small number, but these are some of the most prominent activists in the sort of field of HIV prevention in India. So the interviews actually started um, in 2019, and then um, in March 2020, we we kind of reached out to all the people we had interviewed already, um, asked to interview them again, uh, and then continued our interviews after that, sort of with COVID-19 in mind. So I did these, this part, um, this part of the talk is drawing on a collaborative project with two um, other scholars.
scholars um, Subhadra Panchanadishwaran and Shubha Chako. Um, so, um, so, so what I'll talk about now is kind of drawing from more of these interviews with some reference to the, the um, ethnographic fieldwork in my first book. Um, so within the political terrain of AIDS activism in India, um, AIDS had largely become a kind of dirty word. So it signified a biomedical apparatus that must be constantly battled and overtaken, something to always be suspicious of. Um, these are two comments from a collaborator and colleague, Akai, who's a transgender activist um, based in Bangalore. And these are two quotations from kind of, the first one is from an interview with her in 2012, and the second is actually from her autobiography, which I helped her write and came out in 2021. So in the first one, and you can, I'll, I'll let you read it. Um, she talks about, and this is she's sort of talking about ongoing HIV interventions. She talks about how HIV institutions sort of refuse to uh, acknowledge the, the, the priorities of the transgender community. So she says, you know, the government just keeps dumping money on this community and saying the only thing that matters for you is HIV. But HIV is not the only thing. Um, in this later um, quotation, she's reflecting on her experience of working as an HIV peer educator. Um, and in this part of her book, she kind of goes on to talk about how um, while she was doing HIV prevention work, she also used that time to do organizing work around her area of interest, um, which was rights-based claims. Um, so for many of our interviewees, um, the kind of terrain of HIV was a complex battleground. Um, the Indian state faced pressure from glo global institutions to treat it as an exception and differently from other public health problems. Um, but this urgency was also conditional and it changed as the numbers changed and particularly when the numbers went down, even though this kind of apparatus had been constructed around the response. Um, and um, here's uh, another quotation from uh, an activist speaking to this, right, and her realization uh, that all of this is going to be very short-lived. Um, she says, there's a shelf lock to lo life to a shock. Um, what you can also see toward the end of this quotation is her insistence um, that this requires on the part of civil society groups a certain kind of vigilance, right, that there needs to be an ongoing fight to insist that even after the crisis um, is over, that there is still attention to the citizenship claims of these groups who have previously been um, ignored. Um, so most of the people I talked to uh, when I was um, doing my research on the AIDS response and in these interviews in the kind of post-AIDS era um, were with people who um, were professionally funded by and running organization around AIDS. And yet, when you talk to them about it, really saw AIDS as kind of low on their list of priorities. Uh, and they came from other movements that sort of enabled them to challenge the, the structures of AIDS um, organizing. Um, so civil society groups had to kind of rely on their own organizing structures in order to challenge these uh, frameworks and these temporalities. Um, here's another activist who talks about um, the short-term orientation of COVID relief programs. Um, and she goes on to say in, later in this interview that um, a lot of what uh, or these organizations did in their COVID relief programs, um, partly because the Indian government had uh, increased restrictions on foreign funding for, for community-based organizations, had to rely on some of the infrastructures they'd built during COVID to turn short-term relief efforts into more long-term um, work. Um, here's another um, similar quotation from another activist, just pointing to the importance of this collective strengthening. I'm kind of moving a little faster um, just so that we um, stay on time. Um, but here I just want to note that for this activist, it's really important to uh, position sex work in relation to a broader set of struggles around unorganized work. Uh, and that part of the struggle is kind of essential to challenging the more limited temporality of AIDS interventions. 
Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, why am I a reluctant global health sociologist? Prerna asked us to kind of reflect on, you know, what is, um, what are new directions in global health? And when, when, when you said that, I was thinking, well, I've always felt really uncomfortable with the, the label of a global health scholar. Um, I was trained as a political sociologist, as a feminist sociologist, in queer theory, as a student of social movements, maybe globalization, but not necessarily global health. Um, and I think that this has given me a reluctance to take global health institutions at their word and to take the uh, concerns of global health uh, institutions or the temporalities imposed by them uh, as given uh, in the way that I st uh, study the boundaries of a social problem. So for my interlocutors, who I've sort of highlighted here, both HIV and COVID are kind of vehicles for their political aspirations, but they don't contain them. Uh, and I think that one of the um, important things that our critical social science scholarship can do to enrich global health uh, is to insist on kind of broadening the temporal landscape of the study of global health problems. In other words, part of our analytical task is not to kind of take it as given where the crisis begins and where the crisis ends, but to connect the short crises to the long crises, maybe the crises of capitalism, the crises of patriarchy, racial violence, um, to the crises of the macro system and the crises of everyday life. Um, so I'll end there. I'll just say also this is pretty impressionistic, but there are two articles that kind of lay these out more, more systematically, these ideas out more systematically. One is an article that just came out in Global Public Health um, called Between Pandemics. And another is an article that just came out that was co-published with Siri um, and is on uh, transnational feminist methodologies in global health. Um, so please check those out and thank you. Thank you to all of you um, for your heroic efforts in really giving us such exciting perspectives in such short little chunks of time. So um, I'm going to immediately open this up uh, to the, the kind of, again, heroic few who have made it through our lightning talks. And so comments, questions, suggestions. Yeah, and if you could introduce yourself. And sorry, my name is Prerna Singh. I head the graduate program in development, which is the kind of organizing entity for this talk. Hello. Um, so I I have a few questions um, for like uh, um, several of the researchers. So like Can I would introduce yourself, please. Well, I wanted to ask first, like, are we going like per researcher, or can I ask all of them at once? You can, I think you can just ask your questions. Okay. Um, my name is Betsy Archulis. I'm a fourth year. PhD candidate in the history department at Brown. Um, I um, I think I first have um, a few questions for Dr. Sue. Okay. Um, so I'm curious what you mean by social capital um, in access to um, like the abortive pills. I'm also interested in like why the method of ethnography. Um, in like for this research um like what like what makes the mode of ethnography um most useful in the types of questions you're asking and then related to that is like what types of questions are you asking um like when you interview um <laughs> people or like what type of questions are your like graduate research assistants um like directed to ask um, and then I'll just give all of them at once, actually. Um, and then I also wanted to ask, um, I'm sorry, uh, the, in the plaid shirt, I forget your name. I'm oh, sorry. uh, Kevin Croak. Croak? Yeah. Okay, um, I wanted to ask Dr. Croak, um, like how you're defining low income, um, why, like, in, as well as um, like why why these countries why Africa as the locus um, of focus for your questions and like like what are the metrics that we're using to define Nigeria as low income um, and sort of 
I don't like if I, I I understand that I don't know like the World Health Organization is using sort of like daily dollar cost of living and defining sort of like income, but like like why in your specific project? Um, I guess the sort of because like the thought behind my question there is like. I don't know. In I, I study South Korea, and um, with eight dollars USD in South Korea, which we don't consider a low-income country generally, like the World Bank no longer considers them low-income. But like you can buy a lot of things, and you can survive on like those eight dollars. Versus in the U.S., you can barely get like a meal, right? So. If if the sort of standard is like I don't know like one to two dollars a day in Nigeria, like what are the sort of like political stakes in using this, um, like as the mode of like measurement? Um, and I guess sort of uh, like how do you engage with that without? Um, uh, I'll 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 leave that like more broad ended, yeah. yeah. Um, and oh, and I'm also curious about like the use of the term like clientelism. Um, in truth, I feel like a bit critically about it because I think that it it is a bit like reminiscent of terms like tribalism, um, which I. Uh, fine are more related to the like colonial aspect aspects of political science where it like sorry could I just ask you maybe just to condense your questions a little if, okay if possible? yeah yeah thank you okay yeah so like why clientelism what makes this distinct from what house representatives are doing why do we call it clientelism in Nigeria sure but right. we never use the term in the US um, and then for um, I also don't know the name of. Uh, Why don't you ask your question? I'm sure they'll figure out who it is. <laughs> okay. Um, in the presentation, uh, ma'am, on uh, um, sorry, like the institutional logic presentation, um, I'm wondering, like, why James Scott, um, and sort of because, uh, in the historiography there are a lot of critiques on how James Scott is using ideas of institutional logic and um, and how he applies these metrics of logic across really like broad temporal and spatial realities. So like, I don't, I, I'm curious in how um, you're utilizing that in your research. Um, Maybe great. we should take one yeah. Question is uh, yeah. Can you? I, I have. <laughs> do you have more? I, why don't? Can I ask to return to you, if possible? I just want to make sure that if yeah, anybody else has I a question. Sure. sure. Would, do you have a last one, or are we done? Um, I only have a last one. Okay, that would be great. If you just okay. want to ask your last question, then we can hopefully then get some responses as well. Yeah, and then, like, still related to the institutional logic um, presentation, like. Where does the, like, where where does that institutional logic come from? Um, like I thought your like critique of the, uh, like cultural umbrella as the explanation for everything, um, was like really potent. But then I also wonder like logic itself has a cultural history, and like is itself very much situated in like a specific like cultural and like temporal and like I don't know like colonial definition um like so what makes it not cultural like what definition of logic like are you thinking about in your work yeah great sorry. thank you no no please those were really really thought-provoking questions thanks for your very very close engagement um we're grateful for it so maybe we should take all the questions. Yes, I was going to suggest that if yeah. that's okay with you, is maybe just open it up, collect questions, and then we can have last, you know, some thoughts. Yeah, Danny, and after Danny, Dan. 
so Professor Sue, I have a question about um, misoprotol. Uh, so I had, um, a, um, sorry, my name is Danny Choi. I'm a professor in the political science department. I have a project on um, abortion access in Zambia. In the process, we interviewed um, around 150 parliamentarians. And one of the conversations, because abortion is increasingly um, politicized, was there were some concerns among these policymakers that in a way the, the drug was basically a way to bypass some of the regulations that go into uh, offering abortion access to women, right? So in the Zambian context, you need three healthcare pro providers to actually sign on to receive abortions. Mm -hmm. And some of the more conservative MPs, um, mostly men, <laughs> um, actually voiced their concerns about whether that was a sort of a backdoor way of um, receiving abortions um, bypassing the sort of a legal sort of framework. Um, and I was wondering whether you saw any of that kind of concern voiced in the countries that you were studying. So thank you everybody, those are great presentations. Uh, one provocative question to, that anybody can answer. Um, kind of lurking behind all the presentations, um, my, my name is Dan Smith, I'm Professor of Anthropology and Director of the African Initiative here at Watson Institute. So one, one question or issue lurking behind all the presentations, most explicitly brought up by Siri when she talked about the, 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 the effort to decolonize research and, and, and the, the fact that the most difficult institution to deal with in, in, in navigating all that was Brandeis, right? In some ways not surprising, I guess. But lur lurking behind all of this is, is possibly decolonization as one issue. But it strikes me that across all the, all the papers, all the, all the projects, all the obstacles to effective global health that you've identified are a whole range of things that don't easily fit under decolonization, right? So, so health technology assessment, I mean, you know, maybe they named it wrong. I mean, my, w w w w I, it took me two minutes to kind of zero in on your presentation as it often does when we switch, switch speakers. And by the time we got eight minutes into it, I'm like, health technology assessment, what is that again? <laughs> you know, and, and, and compared to conditional cash transfers, right? I mean, and uh, with, with, um, with the, 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 the three country presentation, I mean, the differences across those countries, arguably, maybe they are, maybe they aren't, you know, attributable to us just to the legacies of colonialism. In Britain, all this inequality taking place within the colonial power itself. In Gallery's presentation, you know, temporality, I mean, it seems like the, the, the temporality crisis question intersects with, the, with the legacies of colonization, but probably will still be there, even, even if we ever address like the legacies of colonialism. So I guess my question is like, how do you think about all these problems that you guys have identified and which ones are, fit with a decolonizing agenda and which ones won't be addressed even if we do better with the decolonizing agenda? Thank you. I have a bunch of questions, but I also note that I have the luxury of more time with all our speakers. So I want to see if, um, yeah. Great. So if that's okay, maybe we'll turn it back over and go in reverse order. So maybe Gauri, if you wanted to go first, and Siri, we'll end with you. Sure. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll speak to the um, decolonization questions. And I really appreciate that it, that you identified that as a theme that kind of connects all these presentations. Um, Decolonization is a word that gets thrown around a lot and means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I actually see that in our presentation, you know, there are a few different ways that decolonization is operationalized. And one is in the kind of knowledge production process, the kind of work that Siri is doing and collaborating with African universities. And then another is sort of in um, our epistemological framework, right? How do we identify concepts? Um, uh, how do we you know, define uh, what the problem even is? And then uh, another way, you know, and I think you refer to this as sort of identifying, well, what are the legacies of colonialism and colonial rule in the you know, regulatory landscapes that we're studying? Um, so I can say that in my project, one of the things that's been interesting to think about is that, um, that many of the regulatory aspects of managing crisis um, in India as a kind of post-colonial country um, have their roots in colonial regulation. So, um, and, and there's a certain cyclicality to that too. So sex workers in particular have kind of been caught up in rounds of regulation and kind of repeated moral panics, each one shaped by um, the legacies of colonial rule. And so um, I think part of it, the decolonizing move might actually be to think about 
sex worker is kind of in a way that does not link them to disease, um, which you know I don't fully do because I study them in relation to HIV. But I think that is kind of the, one of the possibilities of, of decolonization. Um, but I think you know all of us need to be thinking about decolonization on all those different registers, you know, to, to really move to move the field of global health forward. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. Sure. Um, so I'll speak to your question about decolonization as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think in my course I teach on the politics of global health, we begin with reimagining global health, um, a, a volume edited by Paul Farmer and colleagues. And uh, this really helps acquaint students with uh, the history of global health, uh, how much it is grounded in, you know, colonialism, and we start there. And this theme we keep returning to in Metrics, What Counts uh, in Global Health by Vincent Adams, in Sasha White's great new book, Epidemic Orientalism. And I think one of the things that you see in those conversations is the way in which the legacies of colonialism uh, carry through today, right, in global health governance and the degree in which uh, corporations from the global north are empowered not only to make decisions but to profit uh, in global health. Um, and, uh, and, and these inequities that, that result from uh, both kinds of arrangements. Um, and so there's kind of a through line that these uh, important global health readings draw on. And I think that in my presentation, one of the things that I was trying to, to, to get at in drawing that sort of uh, out at the very end is the way in which um, the uh, inequality in terms of access to this new technology that could help level the playing ground within countries uh, who effectively deploy it um, is, is in essence incapacitated, right? Because the WHO, the World Bank, could have done a better job in helping to get the technology into the hands of people who could use it. Um, and uh, thereby, uh, you know, this ended up giving corporations a, a, a leg up, right? Um, and so we see the same thing all over again that we did 200, 300 years ago. <laughs>